Hey, are you a business owner, entrepreneur, or professional? If so, we want you to apply to be a featured guest on our show. My name is Adam Torres, and I host the Mission Matters series of podcasts. I've recorded over 3,000 episodes, and we are just getting started. How do you know if you'd be a good guest to be on the show? Well, only one way to find out, and that's to apply, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We want guests that have a story to tell, guests with a brand, a product, or a service that can benefit my audience of listeners. If this sounds like you, go to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. I'd love to talk to you and get to know more about your story. Again, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, now let's get into the show. Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres to keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, findings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author in one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Charlie Regis on the line, and he's founder at Peach Collective and co-founder over at Stylist Tech. Charlie, welcome to the show. Adam, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on. All right, Charlie. So today's topic, I will say, um, is quite a lot of a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives listen to this show, and uh, and tech innovators. And this is a, always a hot topic. So, how to build building successful apps? Like, what does it take to fundraise? What does it take to get that idea from your mind to you know an app? Um, so uh, excited to get into that. And just to get us kicked off, I'll uh, start with our signature question. So, Charlie, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. So that's our mission here. Charlie, what mission matters to you? Sure. So I think to me, um, I grew up with a single mom who decided to roll the dice on becoming an entrepreneur, and it changed our lives, right? And to me, having lived that paradigm shift, being able to help people chase and achieve their dreams, whether it's through building an amazing app or helping them fundraise or plugging them into amazing networks that help them scale. To me, being that plug and play asset to help people fly higher than they could imagine is is really what I love most about the game that I'm playing right now. Man, I love that. I'm like, I'm sitting here getting inspired. I love bringing on mission-based entrepreneurs. So, so it ran in the blood. Mom, mom got you started. That's an awesome story. Uh, I love to hear it. Um, so maybe just to get us kicked off, so let's start off with telling us a little bit more about your company. So tell us a little bit more about Peach Collective and Stylist Tech. Sure. So my journey in this game started six or seven years ago um, when I co-founded and have grown what is now one of the leading digital innovation studios in the UK. Uh, and what that means is that we work with Fortune 500 companies all the way through to an amazing ecosystem of startups, creating world-class digital products. So that can be an app, it can be a web app, it can be you know really next-generation tech like a visual internet or virtual reality surgery training. Um, and what we do is we have a very human-centric approach. We really take understanding people as the priority and then build digital products in a way that can shape behavior to achieve the goals that that company is, is looking to achieve. So that's really where I cut my teeth in this innovation game and really understanding innovation, particularly on a digital side. Um, and then the Peach Collective, I kicked off uh, a few years ago, is a, a global investment network powered by world-class entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs in different areas of the world who have been there and done it traditionally with a couple of exits under their belt who collaborate over the best deal flow that they have in each of their ecosystems so that our investment networks in our countries get access to the most exciting opportunities in the game. And our portfolio of companies that were helping raise money get access to, to the global network. And we're very lucky to be working with some very special projects. And it's awesome. So I guess just to um, – so first off, the, the obvious question here is what does it take to build a successful app? You need to have a really clear understanding of a problem. 
right? I think what happens too much, and what I see all the time with founders and where we try and help them out, is they fall in love with an idea of a product. You know, I want my products to be able to do this. And, you know, the chances of that being successful are, are minimal. You know, the best products are born out of a, a real serious problem that somebody is, is trying to solve. You know, so for example, if I've been really frustrated about how inconvenient it is for me to have my car washed and serviced, I might create an on-demand service provided for, for car services, essentially an Uber for car services, something like that. Or if I was trying to create uh, a more engaging way for people to shop online, I might explore different, more visual ways of showing products online. So really starting with a problem is the key and then understanding that the product will evolve until the end of time, so long as you're alive. You know, the product is never mm -hmm. finished. It's constantly innovating, um, all user-centric, all trying to understand people and, and shaping the way that, that people are behaving because of your app. So let's say that you have this, um, you know, you have this idea and you're, you're like, okay, like I'm, I'm willing to dedicate time. I'm willing to dedicate resources. Um, and I think it's going to make a difference, right? Um, like, so now you get to the stage of like, how to pay for it. So you're like, whether you're going to, you know, yeah. obviously be able to bootstrap it yourself, whether you're going to fundraise, like all these other things. Um, obviously the paying for it yourself part, I feel like people got that one covered. They're like, they have the money in the bank or they don't, they're going to borrow or they're not. They have like maybe, yeah. um, you know what I mean? They have resources or they don't is what it comes down to. But let's say that maybe they, or, or maybe they don't want to use those resources. So they're thinking that they'd like yeah. to kind of diversify the risk and they, and they like to bring on other, you know, other, other, other people to help fund that. Like in your experience, like where do where do people like start with that fundraising side of things? And I know that's going to vary, right? Because yeah. some people are a lot more. Some people are just starting out. Some people are very advanced and they have a track record. Like so, you know, just broadly speaking, like where do you think people start? And you can handle those in different sure. segments, of course. If I'm a first time founder, one of the most important things is to be able to visualize the product. Right? If I'm building an app, my product is app based. It's very difficult for you to go into a market and to raise money on just a pitch deck that's explaining an idea, right? But you don't have the $100,000 or whatever it's going to cost to build an app. What I really encourage founders to do is, number one, actually speak to your users and make sure that this is something that's solving a, a problem and a pain. But secondly, I would collaborate with a designer or a design studio or something like that, and I would design five to six screens. So don't to build anything. You know, this we call them money shots in the game. So we need to get you some money shots so that you can show investors this is what it's going to look and feel like and you can tell a narrative around the product and the idea and how this product is going to, going to be a huge value to all kinds of different people, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be my first phase is bringing some sort of vision to life. It might be three or four screens, the major ones, so that you can talk about the value proposition. From there, um, there are lots of different angel networks that you can pump into. If you're in the UK, there are specialist investors that invest in companies that are raising their first 150K and there's massive tax benefits um, for those investors, which you know is a, a huge deal. Um, I would then focus on getting in your first 150K, 200K, build a really lean MVP um, so that you're able to prove that you can execute against at least an element of the vision in terms of getting a product out that's commercially competitive and that's something that solves a problem for your users. So we like to call it a minimum lovable product, a stylus, because we want to release the first thing that is going to have users coming back, essentially. We don't want to have to scrap it afterwards and, and throw it in the can. We want to build on top of it. We want to deliver value straight away. Um, so that would be my two-phase approach is get something designed, you know, that might cost you anywhere from $5,000 up to, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, something like that, depending on where you go. Um, and then from there, leverage those materials and the narrative and all the research that you've done to go and raise a more meaningful amount of money. Um, traditionally with angel investment networks, that would be the place I would start. What are some of the, so you, I mean, you have a lot of experience in this field. You've been doing it for a long time. What are some of the things or, or attributes that you've seen? And I don't mean necessarily like, 
product design. I just mean from the from the business side and the entrepreneurial side of what you've seen people do well that has worked in some of their fundraising activities. Hmm. I think one of the really key things to understand for any entrepreneur getting into this game is that you are in the entertainment business. You know, this is what Wall Street was in the 80s and 90s. You know, this is the modern day dream. If you're not able to consistently tell your narrative, build on your narrative, create momentum and tell the story around momentum, then you're going to find it really tough if you're not able to execute on that level. You know, this is about bringing an investor on a journey with you. You may be talking to an investor for three, four months before they invest. You know, you have, they have to build that relationship. They have to build that trust. They've got to see some progress. Um, so for me, it would be being able to create that narrative and then also being able to show momentum. Now, as a young startup, momentum can be difficult, right, because the idea is probably changing a little bit. You know, you're getting a little bit of traction in one area and it might be dying in another area. If it's a B2B product, it might be, uh, filling up your sales pipeline, you know, getting some letters of intent, you know, wh- where does that fit in with your narrative? You know, you have to be chasing momentum, any type of momentum. It doesn't always need to make direct sense in the moment or be in a really straight line in the moment, but you have to be able to take the small things that are happening within your ecosystem and within the journey of the startup and leverage that to create a narrative that showcases meaningful momentum. That's what investors are looking for at an early stage, somebody that can get the the wheels in motion and, and start to make things happen. Man, that's that's really well said, and I couldn't agree with you more, and I will say that I've interviewed quite a few people, and I've heard very few people in the tech space, especially in the app space, um, come up with an answer like that in terms of the angle, and I completely agree, and it might be my bias because I guess other people consider me in the entertainment business because I'm in media, and that's what I do full-time, but I feel, and I've always felt this, we're all in the entertainment business, especially if you're in tech and you have an idea and you have, and you're a startup, like, what, like, you're, every Everybody's trying to like get attention and money and dollars. Like if you don't consider yourself part of that entertainment factor, if you think that your your spreadsheet's going to be so compelling or your presentation just based on the way it's designed or this or that, like if you don't think you have to perform too, man, the next person that comes up and does perform, they might be the ones getting that investment over you. That's the way I see it. Exactly, and I think. Another element to it is that when you're talking about numbers and spreadsheets Mm -hmm. and early stage startup, investors really don't care. You know, they mean nothing. You're putting your finger in the air and trying to pull some numbers down. You're never going to hit your targets. If anything, it's almost... Yeah, we're definitely talking Series A. Yeah, Series A on that one, I completely agreed. And just to be clear, like, obviously, you get the further series rounds, it's different. You're a sophisticated investor. You have a lot more things going on. But in that, we're we're talking about that person with the idea in the beginning. It's like, you might, like, there's no way. You might scare people with that market study. (laughs) Yeah, you know, exactly. And I think being realistic with an investor and saying, you know, I think I can genuinely penetrate X amount of the market at a mm-hmm. rate of X, you know, you're better off underselling that and over delivering than right. under delivering, which almost every startup does in, you know, at least in the first couple of years. For sure. No, that's it. It's great, great input, great advice. So um, let's talk about the, uh, so you, again, so thinking about like the next stage, you have your idea, maybe you raise some funds and maybe now you're looking at, okay, we got a little bit of money. We're thinking about the next thing. So like now you're going on to hiring and the idea of like the remote work place that we're at nowadays. Um, what are your comments on that? Like, so remote work and hiring great talent. Sure. Um, hiring great talent as a young startup, um, I think you're looking for somebody that is able to execute on a number of different levels. I think as you grow as a company, you can become more specialist in your hires, but when you're young and you have five people, you know, maybe you have six people, unless they're a developer, but if you're talking biz dev or whatever, you've got to have somebody that is at least willing to roll their sleeves up and, and get dirty in a number of areas of the business. You know, you're looking for a generalist who can do some marketing, who can do some PR, who can do some biz dev and some sales. You, know, you just need impact. You know, your question that you should be asking when you're sitting across from somebody is, is this person going to be able 
the needle for me in one way or another. And and that's really where you need to be building these relationships. Um, when it comes to, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Remote work. Um, mm-hmm. I think remote work is a, a modern day reality, to be honest. I think it's it's something that we've done at Spider for a meaningful amount of time. Um, I think having a process for um, checking in with your team every day at a certain time and having a really clean line of communication around um, challenges and difficulties and stuff like that are all very doable. Um, if possible, if you all, all are in one country and you just like to work from home, having one day a week when you're all in the office is nice, but it's not, it's not a necessary, uh, it's not a need. I think the only thing that I've found challenging with serious remote working is the time differences. So, for example, if we had a uh, one of our team go and work in Asia for a couple of months or something like that, um, the time difference is the only thing that that is the real hurdle. But you know, it's it's doable. Um, but for me, I would like to keep things in a you know a three-hour time difference either way in an ideal world. That's awesome. Well, Charlie, this has been um, great having you on the show today. Love bringing mission-based entrepreneurs and uh, and businesses on the line. If somebody's listening to this and they want to learn more about um, Peach Collective or Stylish Tech, um, what's the best way for them to to connect and to follow up and reach out? Sure. So a number of different ways. If I'm completely honest, the best way to get my attention is to hit me up on LinkedIn. It's, if you type Charlie Regis and Stylish, you'll find it. Um, feel free to find us at www.stylist.com or you can um, shoot me an email at charlie.regis at stylist.com um, and I'll, I'll do my best to get back to you. But if you want the biggest hit rate, find me on LinkedIn and, uh, and I'm your guy and we'll, we'll run something up for sure. Fantastic. Well, Charlie, again, appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing more about your background and all the great work that you're doing. And uh, to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. Hope you learned a lot. If you did, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. We definitely want you to be a return visitor and a return guest. And uh, Charlie, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. Appreciate you for having me.